morning. My name is Brent L.B. Show, and uh, as Pastor Harry said, I usually do this about once a year, and uh, it's my pleasure to do the first message in this series of the One Another's, and I will be speaking on Forgive One Another. As I begin, I, I want to just tell you a kind of a curious thing. You know, I have prepared many messages over the years, but I never remember feeling so compelled to be praying continuously. I was writing up all these long prayers as I, I did this. I, I never remember quite being that way as I was preparing in the past. And maybe it's because forgiveness and restoration are so central to the heart of our faith. And this then is my first and most perhaps obvious point. If we want to forgive well, we need to be praying. So let's just do that as we begin. Lord, we come to you today as complicated people, people with past hurts, past and present guilt. We confess that sometimes we justify bad behavior and we nurse grudges. We are people in need of forgiveness. We also want to know the freedom that comes from forgiving others. Lord, teach us again why we should forgive. Lord, sometimes it seems so hard to forgive when it just seems like justice hasn't been served. Remind us, Lord, what happens if we do not forgive. Walk with us as we start to talk about working through the practical aspects of forgiveness. Open our hearts and our minds to see wonderful things from your word today. Amen. Allow me to start by telling you about a time in my life where I had to work out forgiveness and reconciliation. And it was with my biological father. I had actually probably seen him about two times in about 25 years since my parents divorced. And I uh, had just completed a master's in counseling at Providence Seminary. And so, you know, I, I thought, well, it's time to practice what I preach and I've been learning about and try and make some reconciliation with my father. So uh, I was actually traveling up to Camelot's uh, to look at uh, medical work here, and I had a stopover in Calgary where my, my father was living. And so I contacted him and initiated that, and he said, yeah, he would like to meet with me. So uh, I just felt I needed to share with him I, you know, what it was like for me, having not seen him all that time, that after the divorce he seemed like he didn't make an effort to, to have contact with me as a son. And I remember when I was four years old, I remember sick telling my mom, Mom, I think I should go with my dad because I'm a boy. And feeling kind of, you know, lost. Now, in retrospect, that would have been a really bad idea. With my dad. <laughs> but, you know, trust the Lord. So, anyway, those were some of the things I needed to share. And, you know, also it affected me, you know, seeking approval from peers in ways that, because I felt unlovable. There's a lot of things that came from that. I need to talk about that a little bit with him. So, we met that day. And, you know what? It was a great time. We actually, uh, I heard some of his side of the story. I shared some of how, how it affected me. And we were having just this great connection and conversation. And I looked up at the time and I realized, I'm gonna miss my plane. <laughs> and so I grabbed my carry-on bag and I'm starting, I said, I gotta go, let's go, we'll talk again. And I'm running towards the departure gate. And my dad gets up and he's running beside me. Two guys with long gangly legs, it's like two white Kevin Durant's heading towards the basket. <laughs> Except we couldn't run that fast and we can't jump at the end, but still, we were just hoofing it and you say, hey, I can still keep up with you, son. So it was a great memory, it's still a great memory in, in my, my mind. And I won't go into all the details, but uh, I want to, I'll, I'll touch back on that a little later. The point is, I wanted to start with some, uh, somewhere, sharing an experience where it was actually hard to come to that point of forgiveness but that there's also rewards with forgiving. And maybe as you even looked at this message this morning, you were thinking of some estranged family member 
that you need to forgive and reconcile with. Perhaps it's a coworker, a boss. It may even be your spouse. But forgiveness, especially with those that are closest to us, that we have the highest expectations for, those can be sometimes the hardest people to forgive. Let's look at this passage together in Matthew 18. Uh, perhaps it will come up on the screen, uh, starting in verses 21 and going through 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and he asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like the king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children all had to be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay everything back. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him by the neck and choked him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged, <coughs> he was being choked. Be patient with me. I will pay it all back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had that man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants, though, saw what had happened, they were outraged, and they went and told their master everything that had happened. The master called the servant in, you wicked servant. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister from your heart. May God bless the reading of this word. It seemed uh, appropriate as I was looking at this to maybe look at the chapter briefly uh, for a little context that, that leads up to this parable. And it seems no accident at the very beginning of chapter 18 that we uh, hear Jesus telling his disciples, a person must change and become like a little child if they want to enter the kingdom of heaven. And what better place to start than the humble, unassuming state of childhood if we're going to both receive forgiveness and also offer forgiveness? Things are a little simpler at that age. You know, uh, over the many years of, of doctoring and counseling, I, I've come to understand that people can be very complicated and their motives can be very complicated. And as I suggested in my opening prayer, we are indeed a complicated people ourselves. People with baggage from past hurts. We have sophisticated ways of telling half-truths to others and to ourselves. You know, as I, I thought about this, praying this message, I was thinking, Lord, thank you that I heard the message of the gospel when I was a child, when I was perhaps just more open. <laughs> I'm very thankful for that. Because, you know, we do. We get more old and we get more complicated and perhaps even more cynical. Jesus reminds us that we need to become unpretentious if we want to enter the kingdom of God and if we want to forgive. Stop for a moment to just think, when's the last time you could describe yourself as unpretentious, open to learn, even as a little child? Hopefully that's today. So Matthew begins and ends this chapter speaking about the kingdom of heaven. And after speaking about children, at the beginning, he goes on to speak about the lost sheep, and then he goes on to speak about, perhaps you could describe him as the black sheep, 
that the sinner who uh, needs confronting and uh, to bring him back into the fold, into church fellowship. And then he finally he comes to this passage on forgiveness. That's the chapter in a nutshell. So now we're going to look specifically at those verses 21 through 35. And it begins with Peter's uh, question to Jesus, how many times shall I forgive? And he may be wanting to appear uh, generous. He says, seven times, Lord. And Jesus replies, 77, or it could be interpreted 70 times 70. In other words, Peter, just don't give it. Don't keep count. Just forgive. Before we get into that parable, I, I, I talked about this for a little bit. Like, is he serious? 70 times 7? Like, what about serial offenders? What about those among us that we might call shameless criminals? People who r repeatedly abuse their spouse or repeatedly go back into addiction. And I think part of the balance to this is found in a stepwise approach mentioned earlier in this chapter, and that's that the, the famous verse, we think about Matthew 18, we often think about those verses that, you know, when, when someone has sinned, you confront that fellow believer by going to them one-on-one -on -one at first, and if that's not successful, then you go, you maybe get one or two others and go to them and talk it through, and if that's not doesn't work, you go to the church body. And I think this is the, the balance, because I think good things can happen from that. First of all, maybe when you get others involved, sometimes you see that perhaps it's the log in your own eye, and you're trying to get a splinter out of someone else's. Perhaps it takes people that aren't so emotionally involved to help to have that sinner see the error of their ways. But the idea of this is restoration of relationship. That's what it's about. That's why we want to seek this out, to reconcile, to forgive. In the parable, the king releases a servant after he kneels before him, be, be begging, be patient with me. I will pay everything back. His debt is great. The word used is myriads, the Greek word, and it's the largest number for which the Greeks have a word. In other words, you could say he had a myriad of debt. It was really more than he could ever repay, despite what he said. And yet, this king has mercy on him. And again, it's the only other Greek word I'm going to explain. So, but the word used is splash in his face. And uh, any medical people are, are out there may know that splash in his face or splantnik is that word that refers to the gut. So in other words, the, the king had this gut feeling, this feeling of compassion from deep within that he should forgive. It's like it was part of who he was and he, he, he needed to do it. So how do you, I thought about this, like so how do we increase compassion in ourselves? How do we become like that king? And I think for us, it's part of it is we need to continually be reminded how much we've been forgiven and how great that felt. It, it draws to mind the uh, story or the play Les Miserables and Jean Valjean, who is a hardened ex-con, who's finally released and then goes to, commits another crime, but has shown great compassion from undeservedly, really, from a priest, and it transforms his life, and he lives a, 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 a life of serving others from then on. No sooner, however, had this servant, the unmerciful servant, as we describe him, been forgiven, but he goes out and confronts his fellow servant, and who owes him a, a relatively small amount of money compared to the enormous debt he has. The fellow makes the same plea, give me time, I will pay it back, but and he probably could have, but he throws him in prison. And so we have this contrast between a, a very large debt of the first servant and the smaller debt of the second servant and the very compassionate response of the king and the unmerciful servant's response. P. 
people, I think this is conviction time because as I read through this, I thought, man, there's times where I have been unforgiving, where I could be seen uh, as this unmerciful servant. And I was wondering about it, like, is that, has that happened to you? Sometimes we some, just get stuck in our job and we just can't, we can't forgive. It seems maybe it's a lack of compassion, maybe it's a lack of courage, Maybe it's a lack of humility. Of course, the king learns of the unmerciful servant's behavior, and he confronts him about it, and he is thrown into prison to the tormentors, it says. The conclusion, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. And the idea is not half-heartedly, not grudgingly, but with your whole heart, and not saving some ammunition in your back pocket for later. That's not, that's not wholehearted forgiveness. Let's talk about some implications and applications of this forgiveness before I wrap up. I wanted to sort of make three points in application. So, one, understand what you're forgiving. Number two, tell God about it and ask for help. God needs to be involved in every stage of this. Number three, remember forgiveness is a decision, not an emotion or a feeling. And it's a decision that you usually have to make again and again and again. So number one, understand the offense and how it affected you. And I think part of this is so you don't superficially forgive and say, yeah, I forgive that, it didn't really matter anyway. You know, we can sometimes do that when we really haven't thought about how this offense did affect us. And it can go both ways. I think the other thing is sometimes we we make a big thing out of something when we really, if we thought it through and talked to God about it, we'd learn, you know what, I'm leaving the cap off the, the toothpaste. Yeah, it's not such a big thing. And so we need to get some perspective as far as what we need to forgive as a, as a starting point. Um, some things we just need to let go. Think about James 1.19. He reminds us, don't be quick to take an offense. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And yet, there is a time to become angry. There are things that are perpetrated against people, sometimes us, sometimes against our loved ones, that should cause anger. And yet in Ephesians 4 and 26 we're tired, told, be angry, but do not sin. Do we need, uh, oh, just let me say as well, that if someone has been abused, uh, something horrible has happened uh, in, in the past, it may be healthy for them to forgive, to free them, their heart of, and to start to heal, but it doesn't mean that they need to start to have contact with the, that past abuser right away. Uh, do we need to see repentance before we forgive? And I think this is a biblical context. This is the ideal. Luke 17, 3 reminds us, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive. If someone, I think the emphasis is, if someone has asked for forgiveness, you need to forgive. Pastor Harry recently reminded me of a quote by Lewis Smead. Uh, to forgive is to set the captive free and to, to discover that captive was you. In a similar vein, we could think of the, the, the quote, holding onto bitter, bitterness is like drinking poison yourself and expecting the other person to die. Better to understand how you've been hurt, and if possible, and with help if necessary, appropriately confront the offender. Again, the point of confronting wrongs and offering forgiveness is ultimately to restore relationship between people and with God. Second point, pray. Again, God needs to be all over this. He needs to be at the center of this. If we are going to forgive, and work towards reconciliation. 
God will ultimately see that justice is done. We need to rest in that. Frankly, you know what? We're really not that good at working out justice on our own. And as I prepared this message, I was thinking as well about our legal and our judicious, uh, judicial system. Like, what a hard task they have. I don't think I've ever thought about that as much either. Like, you know, they're often dealing or with partial information and trying to make the right decision as to the consequences. Whereas God is all-knowing. He sees it all. He knows what, what needs to be done. And in Romans 12, 19, he says, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Well, every sin ever committed on this earth will be dealt with God by one of two ways. First, as Romans 6.23 reminds us, the wages of sin is death. Sin separates us from our Holy Father. And hell separates us eternally. God takes sin very seriously. But, the verse goes on, for a while, the, the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, while God takes sin very seriously, he also takes forgiveness very seriously. And we can rejoice in that. It is why the second way of dealing with sin is to nail it to the cross with Jesus Christ. That is why we need to confess our sins regularly as Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer. And, you know, when, when this servant standing before you someday comes to that, that judgment day and stands before my Lord, I'm going to say, I can't pay. I can't pay the debt. I can't justify my sin. I don't want to justify my sin. I want it nailed to that wondrous cross. How about you? Number three, third point. Remember, forgiveness is a decision. A decision, again, that we need to make over and over. A decision is an act of, uh, remember, forgiveness is an act of will, of obedience to God. And trusting God to, to bring the emotional healing over time Corey Ten Boom reminds us that will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. And there's an excellent, uh, excellent blog posted by Kelly uh, on our church website about never holding grudges. I'd really encourage you to look at that. Say you had an old wound, you know, somebody had maybe stabbed you with a knife. And, you know, again, thank, thank God that our bodies heal. And that wound has healed up. There's some scar there. And you keep rubbing that scar. And you think about how much it hurt at the beginning. And then pretty soon it's hurting just as bad as it hurt when you first suffered that wound. You're really, you're nursing a grudge. You're not nursing the wound to, to heal. And I think we can make a decision to focus on more fruitful things, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, we are meant to think about these things. And perhaps, you know, answering that question, how do you know if you've forgiven somebody? Perhaps when you, you know you've forgiven someone, when you are praising God for your own forgiveness, your own healing, and you're praying for that person, that that harms you, that they would experience that same forgiveness and healing. On another point, medical research has shown that when we don't forgive, when we're full of these negative emotions and bitterness, that it increases our risk of a number of things, including heart attacks, maybe arthritis, and certainly maybe even things like cancer. You see, it changes our hormones. It, it, it increases our clotting factors. It impairs our immune system. We're not just victims in our healing. We can be agents as well. And 
and uh, I wanted to just list a few quotes by Lewis Smedes uh, from his book, The Art of Forgiving, which I, I, I quoted uh, earlier. Some wrongs are worse than other wrongs. Some scratch the skin, uh, and some scour the soul. If we wait for long to forgive, our rage settles in and claims squatter's rights to our soul. And finally, the, 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 the investment in healing usually grows, even with all dividends reinvested in modest increments. There is a turbulence along the route, too, and forgivers can get to feeling that their investment in forgiving is a sucker's choice. It's hard. It can be hard, and that's the reality of it. Don't pretend that forgiveness is always easy. Sometimes it's hard. That's why we need to get God involved in this. Get others involved in it if you need that help. Another really helpful resource is, uh, so that first, those first quotes, and you can go on to the next slide, are from uh, this book, The Art of Forgiving, uh, Lewis Smedes. And the second book I wanted to mention is a, is a helpful resource from uh, a woman named William Dirksen. She's a woman living in Manitoba, and uh, unfortunately, uh, she experienced a terrible tragedy. Her book is called The Way of Letting Go, One Woman's Walk Towards Forgiveness. And it was the year, actually, I graduated from medical school, and Ren and I got married. And uh, we remember hearing about this horrible thing where a teenage daughter was, was abducted, and she was raped and murdered. And these, these brave people decided early on that they had a, a decision to make, and they feared what they would become. That was a big motivating factor for them. They feared what they would become if they gave themselves over to bitterness. And so they, they chose early on that they would work towards some forgiveness somehow. And they didn't do it lightly, believe me. They said in their, their their group, their victim groups, that they, they called it the F word, forgiveness. There was a lot of anger. People didn't want them to talk about forgiveness. It's a very, uh, very, very touching story. Pastor Dave reminded us, though, that this, what we're doing, this One Another series, this is about building up the body of believers, and we're kicking that off today and forgiving one another is so central. We need to be ready to forgive one another, to restore relationships. You know, really, isn't that why we're here? We're all celebrating and worshiping the God who forgave us together. And I just want to remind you of Ephesians 4, 2, 4, 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just in God, just as in Christ God forgave you. If you've not experienced that forgiveness yet, I, I pray you will soon. Come and talk to me. Come and talk to one of the other believers here. And if you haven't yet, I pray that in the meantime that we would be a really good advertisement for that forgiveness. As I conclude, I want to take you briefly back to that airport in Calgary. We're running along. My dad beside me. And you know, for the first time I remember just feeling loved by my dad. He was running after me. It was good. And you know, it wasn't perfect. Human relationships aren't perfect. But there was forgiveness, there was the start of reconciliation. It was good. And I couldn't help thinking about the, the loving father and the prodigal son. You know, he sees him from a distance and he starts running towards him. That's, that's our God. That's our perfect heavenly father. That's the way he loves us. You don't need to justify yourself as better than that sinner, and therefore you don't need to forgive. That'll just push them away. That'll push God away. That'll leave you bitter and lonely, the thing the Dirksons saw early on. You don't need to justify your continued anger or revenge. Give it to God. Forgive because God requires you to forgive to enter heaven. Forgive because a life of bitterness is a living hell. I'll say it again. Forgive because God requires it 
if you want to enter heaven and forgive because a life of bitterness can become a living hell. Let's live out the kingdom of heaven together. Let's start living into that every chance we get. Remember, you are loved and can love. You are forgiven and you can forgive. Forgive as God in Christ forgave you.